Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game Cry Havoc, designed by Grant Rodiak, Mihal Orach, and Mihal Valchek, and published by Portal Games. The riches of an unexplored planet are yours for the taking. Except for the indigenous species that lives there and will fight furiously to protect it. And the other armies that are also racing to gather these resources. Mm, I don't see any way around it. You're going to have to fight your way out of this one. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the game board in the middle of the table. If you have only two players, use this side, but otherwise, flip it over. In this video, we'll set up for a three-player game. There are special rules for four players, and we'll explain those at the end. These are the event tokens which you'll shuffle and place face down onto each of the four marked spaces of the score track that look like this. Any event tokens left over that were not placed onto the board are then returned to the box. You then place this action marker onto the one space of the round actions track found here. These are the terrain tactics cards which come in four types as identified by the symbols found here in the bottom right hand corner. Separate them by type, shuffling them into individual decks that you'll place face down on the spaces of the board here that match their symbols. It'll look like this when you're finished. These are the Trog War Party, Trog Nest, and Exploration Tokens. Shuffle them into face down stacks near the board. Then place a number of them face down onto the spaces of the board with their matching symbols as we see here. When you're done, it will look like this. Now create a supply of these crystals nearby and move an amount to spaces on the board equal to the number showing inside of these symbols. Green crystals have a value of one each, yellow counts as three, and red crystals have a value of five each. Then put out the battle board, these battle tokens, and the enable final scoring token. The battle tokens are numbered from one to eight and you'll place them in a stack in that order with the lowest number on top. There are four different factions in the game and each has a distinct color to identify the components that it will use. Each player now chooses one of these factions and takes those components. For example, what you see here is the humans faction. This trog faction may only be chosen by a player in a four player game, as we'll see later. But if you have fewer than four players, you'll still use the miniatures, so place them nearby, but the rest of the components you can return to the box. Players will have headquarters pieces like this and they should be randomly placed on the spaces of the board that match that outline. They're also labeled with the letters HQ. In this video, we'll be setting up for a three player game. Each player will have a faction board along with a certain number of structure tiles that fit together in a row. The order of these tiles doesn't matter. You'll also have some matching structure tokens. The ones that are pictured here in the upper right hand corner of the tile, I like to place above them. And then the other ones that are differently shaped but show the same images, I like to place below. Place your miniatures in an area known as your reserve and nearby put your large scoring enabled token, unique collection of control tokens, 50 point scoring token, and these egg shaped skill tokens. Now have each player take these three tokens and place one on the zero space of the score track. And then one from each player is placed randomly on the spaces of this initiative track and the rest are placed in the same order below. You'll also have a deck of unique tactics cards for your faction which you'll shuffle and place face down near your other components. These here are your skill cards. You'll always have the skill labeled as default which you'll place here. If it's your first time playing, it's recommended you only use this one skill, but if you're experienced, take another skill at random and if players are veterans of the game, take another one randomly. Skills are placed face up in this area, but we'll just use the default one, returning the rest to the box. These tokens are used with certain skills, so any you don't see identified on the skills that you have, you can remove from the game. Now have each player put four of their miniatures and one of their control tokens on their headquarters. As I mentioned, if you have four players, there are a couple of slight changes to the setup and rules, and I'll explain those at the end of this video. Also, to make it easier to move things around on the table, I'm gonna put most of these components off screen and just bring them back as required. And that's the setup. In Cry Havoc, players will maneuver their units to control key areas of the board, build structures, and grow their armies to gain advantages over their enemies that they'll attack, take prisoner, and destroy. All to gain the most victory points by the end of the game, which will take place over five rounds or less. Each round is divided into six phases that you'll find listed here on your player boards, starting with the three steps of the events phase. 
First, follow this track from zero until you get to the next unrevealed event token, which for the first round is right here. You'll then flip it over, resolve its listed effect, and return it to the box. At the start of the second round of the game, you would instead reveal the next face down event token, which is here. While playing, if a score token would ever pass an event which has not yet been revealed, for example, in this case, if their marker landed on 13 or higher, you'll immediately move it face down on top of the next event. When the next round begins, you'll resolve all tokens here, one at a time, starting at the top. The final event is permanently printed on the board here, so when it is resolved, the game will end that round. Now it's the update initiative step of the events phase. During the game, a player might have played a card like this, which allows them to change the position of their upcoming initiative token. Perhaps the machine faction decides to move into first place. During the round that this occurred, the players will still keep following the turn order as shown here. But during the next round's update initiative step, you'll now arrange the tokens on the top to match what was showing underneath. The final step of this phase is to have all players rotate their skills to the upright position if any were sideways. The next phase of the round is the draw cards phase where each player takes four cards into their hand from their personal deck. If you ever have more than seven cards in hand, discard down to that number. You're allowed to have more than seven later at any other time, but at this point, you must respect the limit. Over the course of the game, you'll form a discard pile here, and if you would ever need to draw more cards than you have in your deck, simply shuffle your discard pile into a new draw deck. Next is the actions phase, and begin by ensuring this marker is in the top position. Now starting with the first player on the initiative track, and following this order, each player takes one action. Then move the action marker down, and have each player take another action in the same order. Move the marker down one last time, and have each player take their third and final action of the round. There are five possible actions as you're shown here, so let's begin by learning about the move action. To perform this action, you reveal and discard any number of cards from your hand, counting up the total number of these arrow movement symbols. In this case, I would gain four movement points. Anytime you're discarding cards to use a specific symbol type, you ignore all other information outside of that row. In other words, using these for movement means I'm not using them for these other symbols or for any text down here. For each point of movement you gain, you can move a unit on the board from where they are to an adjacent region. You can move the same unit multiple times this way or spread the points around moving several different units. And I should mention that when I refer to regions, I mean the areas of the board that are surrounded by these thick borders. You'll notice that some regions have arrows with names indicating that you can move directly from this region to the named one. Meaning that these two regions, for example, are considered adjacent. So are these two, as well as these. If one of your units enters a region with an opponent's units, or with a Trog War Party, or a Trog Nest token, it must stop. However, if you still have movement points left to spend, you can keep doing so with other units, even moving them into the same region. This action ends once you've spent as many of your available movement points as you'd like to. Then you'll complete the following steps. First, if there are any exploration tokens in the regions that the player moved to, flip them over and gain their benefits. In this case, the player draws two cards from their deck, and this one says that they can place two crystals into any regions. Maybe the player decides to put them here. Once resolved, the exploration tokens are discarded. Then for each region that has a Trog War Party or a Nest token, reveal and resolve them as well. These will usually add new Trog figures to the board as this one does, and crystals. Once again, once resolved, this can be discarded. If you can't add the full amount of required Trogs to a region because you ran out while placing them, add as many as you can. If instead you couldn't add any of the required amount, you still place the listed crystals, but the player loses one of their units at that region and returns it to their reserve. In this case though, we had plenty. Now you check to see if any of your units ended their movement in a region with no enemy figures. If so, you take control of that region, placing one of your control tokens there. If an opponent's control token had been in that region, you return it to them. If there are regions where your units entered spaces with enemy figures, then instead of placing control tokens, you'll place battle tokens, starting with the lowest value from this stack. And if you're putting out more than one, you can choose the locations that you assign them to. Then you'll place one of your units on top of each token to show that you were the attacker. These regions are now known as battle regions. Units can never move into an enemy's headquarters or into a region with a battle token. 
This means that once the battle token is added to an area at the end of a movement action, even the players with figures participating in that battle region cannot later move more figures into that region using a move action. In a two or three player game, the trogs are not controlled by any player, so they can never leave a region where there's a battle token. In a battle region containing player controlled units, the defender's figures may leave with a move action, but only those that would be in excess of twice the attacker's units there. So in this case, with one attacker, two defenders would have to stay, but these other two could leave if the player wanted them to. But do note, the attacker's units may never leave a battle with a move action. Next, let's learn the recruit action. Simply discard any number of cards from your hand, and for each of these recruitment symbols, two in this case, move one unit from your reserve into your headquarters region. If your reserve ever runs out, any extra symbols you've spent are ignored. Another action you can take is to build and, or, Activate structures. Again, discard any number of cards from your hand, but now total these building wrench icons to give you what you can spend on building structures or activating ones you've already built. What you can build is represented by these panels, and each faction has their own unique options to choose from. The cost to build a structure is listed here on the left side. Once you pay to build a structure, you take its token and place it into a region that you controlled at the beginning of that action. You can have several different structures within the same region, but you can't build two of the same structures there. Also, a built token can't be moved, and once you run out of tokens for a structure, it can no longer be made. When you want to activate a building, you pay the cost shown here and resolve its listed effect. You can build and activate as many structures as you can afford. However, you may only activate each built structure once per action that you take. As an example, if I had four building points, I could spend two of them to build this harvester. I could then spend a third to activate it, but I could not activate it again during this action. Instead, I might activate this harvester with my fourth point. If on my next action, I discard more cards and use the build and activate action again, I can activate buildings I already activated previously this round. That said, structures cannot be built or activated in a headquarters or battle region unless explicitly stated. Also, if you lose control of a region where you have structures, you cannot activate those buildings, but neither can the opponent that's there. While controlling that region, they can build their own structures and activate them. But if you later kick them out and take control of that region again, you can use your own structures once more. Another action you can instead take on your turn is to draw the top two cards from your own deck or from any one of these four terrain tactic decks. You then choose one of them to shuffle back into the deck you chose from, and the other you add immediately to your hand. The last possible action a player can choose to take is to enable scoring. But to do this, they must play from their hand the one card in their deck that lists here as its effect the ability to enable scoring. When playing a card in this way, you ignore any other symbols here, and instead you take your enable scoring token. The player then puts it onto this space, preventing other players from taking this action that round. We'll see its effects a little bit later. So those are all the actions, but I also want to point out that sometimes you'll find additional symbols on the same row as the movement, recruit, or building ones that you're using. For example, if I was moving and played these, not only would I get two movement points, but for each card symbol in that row, I get to draw a card from my deck and add it to my hand. Sometimes you'll also gain card symbols, but they show a star. For these, you'll draw one card for the first one revealed but ignore any additional ones. So if I had played these four for movement, I would gain four movement points, draw two cards for these symbols, and for these two symbols, I would draw another one. If you gain an exclamation mark, that means you'll also trigger the text written down here next to the matching symbol. As a final note on symbols, playing this one means you'll gain a victory point. Before or after performing your one action on a turn, you may also use any number of skill cards that are upright in front of you. Once you use a skill, rotate it to show it cannot be used again unless it states otherwise. Also, if a skill can be used outside of an action round, it will let you know that on its text. After the action phase, it's time for the battle resolution phase, where each region containing a battle token will be resolved in order from lowest to highest. If somehow, before a region's battle is resolved, all units from one player are removed, discard the battle token and place a control token there for the player with units remaining, if any. When resolving a battle, you'll use this battle board and follow the steps shown here, which we'll go over together. And it begins by telling you to place a single crystal into the battle region. 
This makes regions where battles happen even more valuable over time. Now the attacker takes all of their units in the battle and assigns them as they like onto the left side of the three possible objectives of the battle board. Let's say they decide to place their units like this. Next, the defender assigns their units to the board as they like onto the right side of those three objective spaces. We'll see the effects of placing your units on these different objectives in just a moment, but now the attacker may play a single card. You'll ignore any of the symbols at the top and instead resolve any effects listed here if it starts with the battle keyword. This, for example, would allow the red machines player to move any one of their units to a different objective now that they've seen what the yellow player is doing. Now the defender may choose to play and resolve one card from hand and back and forth you alternate. If a player chooses not to play a card, they can't use any more during this battle, but their opponent can continue playing as many as they'd like. Unlike the cards that you start the game with, which will show your faction symbol, if you have any terrain tactics cards in your hand, they may only be played into a battle if their symbol here matches one of the two symbols shown on the region where the battle is occurring. So in this case, this tactic could not be played, but this one could be. In a two or three player game, when fighting trogs, the player to your left will decide where to place the trogs on the battlefield and may play tactics cards from their hand to boost the trogs forces if they wish. But remember, in a two to three player game, trogs are neutral forces and so they can't gain points or win the game. For this example though, let's go back to the units that we had on here originally. After resolving all cards played into the battle, you now resolve the battle objectives on the board in order from top to bottom starting with region control. Control. The player with the most units here gains control of the region. They'll place one of their control tokens there and immediately score two victory points. This remains true even if all of the controlling player's units become destroyed during the rest of the battle. It should also be noted that if the defender's units tie the attackers, then the defender wins and takes control and the two points. If no units are played to this objective, again, because they're tied, the defender will win the control. And don't worry, you're reminded of all this information on this area of the battle board. Let's put things back the way they originally were, and then we'll move on to the capture prisoners objective. The player with the most units here, the human faction in this case, immediately takes one enemy unit from anywhere on this board and places it in front of themselves. They can even take a unit from the bottom area, which hasn't resolved yet. No matter how many units you have in this area, at most you can only take one unit as a prisoner. And if there's a tie in this area, no prisoners are taken. I should also mention if the neutral trogs win this prisoner objective, the player controlling them takes a prisoner but puts them in a designated trog prison that no single player controls. We'll see what happens to prisoners a little bit later. Finally, for each figure on this attrition objective, their controlling player kills one enemy unit from anywhere on the battle board, gaining one victory point for each one destroyed. These kills are simultaneous, so you can choose to target other units on the attrition objective, but they'll still get to make their kills as well. Dead units are always returned to their controlling player's reserve. I should mention in some special cases, a player not in the battle may be able to use an ability that would also allow them to perform some attrition damage, but if so, their units or tokens are resolved last. The player who won control of the region in the first step now places any surviving units back in the region where the battle occurred. If the winner had actually been the neutral trogs, their units are returned to their reserve and a face down trog nest token is placed in the region. The player who lost the region control objective retreats any surviving units to an adjacent non-battle region under their control. If there isn't one to retreat to, their units instead return to their reserve. If the neutral trogs lost the control objective, their units are removed from the board and a trog nest token is placed in an adjacent uncontrolled region if one exists. Finally, you remove the battle token and repeat these steps for all remaining battle tokens still on the board, starting with the next lowest value. Now it's the prisoner phase. Here, each player scores one victory point for each prisoner they have. Then, in initiative order, each player may spend two victory points per prisoner they wish to take back, adding them to their reserve. Prisoners you don't reclaim will be available for their captors to score again the following prisoner phase, but you'll also be able to reclaim them then at that time if you wish to. The final phase is scoring, which you'll only perform if someone enabled scoring during the action phase, which you'll know because their token will be here. The faction that enabled scoring, the red machines in this case, will score one victory point for every region that they control. We're only looking at a small portion of the map, but in this case, 
three. Then every player scores one victory point for each crystal located in regions they control. So red would gain four extra points, and blue in this case would gain two. Keep in mind, none of this scoring happens during a round unless a player had, during the actions phase, placed their enable scoring token. When collecting points, if a player passes 49, they replace their token with this one, and then continue counting from the start of the track. This is the end of the round, so return the enable scoring token to its player if one was used, and if the game is not over, begin a new round. If at the start of a round during the events phase, the enable final scoring space would be resolved, immediately collect this final scoring token, then place it here. Now, no individual player can enable scoring, and this will be the final round of the game. At the end of the round, during this scoring phase, no one will claim points for the regions they control, but they'll still get one point for every crystal in the regions they control. The player with the most points is then declared the winner. If there's a tie, the tied player who has the most prisoners wins. If there's still a tie, the tied player who went later in the initiative order is the winner. Here's a couple other quick rules. Crystals can never be placed in headquarter regions, and a region is not considered occupied for gameplay purposes if only structures, exploration, or trog tokens are located there. There are some special rules when you have four players, so let's go over those now. First of all, one player will control the trog faction itself, taking all the related components. And then, instead of placing a trog war party here as before, they'll instead place the trog headquarters, two trog units, and a control and tunnel token. Three other tunnel tokens will then go into the spaces that show that icon in their region. When moving, trogs treat all regions that contain tunnel tokens as if they are adjacent, so this trog could move immediately to this region. And when a trog moves into a region with a trog war party token or a nest token, you reveal it and then place the indicated trogs and crystals. These new units are now available for the trog player to use even during the same movement that they were brought into play. In a battle, if the trog player loses the region control objective, their figures retreat like other players, but if that's not possible, then they're returned to the reserve instead of placing a trog nest token in an adjacent space like you'd do in a two or three player game. If instead they win the control objective, their figures are placed in the region, but again a nest token is not. And the final rule when using trogs in a four player game during scoring phases, trogs only score half the total points for crystals rounded up. So in this case, the trog player would score three points. And that's everything you need to know to play Cry Havoc. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.